Hello. Um, gosh, that was really powerful, wasn't it? Thank you so much, Davino, for sharing those thoughts with, with us today. I'm Joanne, Joanne Smithson. I'm from the What Works Centre for Wellbeing. Um, and I'm going to talk to you um, today about um, our approach to, to wellbeing. We're going to explore what our priorities will be for public mental health research and, and explore maybe how if we add a wellbeing lens to our research or we, or we maybe add a wellbeing metric um, to our research outcomes, the difference that could help in terms of building the evidence base of what works to improve public mental health. Just before the pandemic, there were an estimated 4 million people with low wellbeing in the UK. 4 million people living in misery. From my perspective, it's really important that our five-year research programme to improve public mental health is wellbeing creating, it's solutogenic, as well as supporting those with the lowest wellbeing. So I work for a What Works Centre. We're part of the UK's national network of What Works Centres. Some of the centres you may have heard of are the, the Early Intervention Foundation, the Centre for Ageing Better, or maybe the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. We're all What Works Centres. And together as part of the What Works Network, our aim is to improve the way in which governments and other organisations create, share and use high quality evidence in decision making. It's about supporting more effective and efficient public services at local and national level. And as Janelle Tarushi um, discussed early before lunch, it's about supporting decision makers as well, helping people make choices with a deeper understanding of how those policies or interventions will affect people's lives. It's great today that we're celebrating 10 years of working together for public health. It's about 10 years ago when, when colleagues, um, including Professor Kevin Fenton and the former public PhD, nurtured the concept of a What Works Centre with a focus on wellbeing. They incubated us within PhD and then set us out um, to be fully established in our own rights. But, that program of measuring national wellbeing has been around for 10 years. You know, in the UK, um, we're really the envy of many nations in having this amount of data that we have. Many of our core big quantitative data sets have wellbeing measures included. So we have not only um, a longitudinal series, but we have a set of metrics, the ONS4 metrics that can help us understand how we're doing and the impact of our services on people's lives. But when I talk about wellbeing, what do I mean? Broadly, it's about feeling good and functioning well. The Office of National Statistics, the ONS definition, is well-being is how we're doing as individuals, as a community and as a nation, and how sustainable that is for the future. So there's a real strong capitals and futurity element to that as well. Broadly, it's subjective. It's how we feel in ourselves and how we experience life as a whole. So if we were to have a public mental health research programme that maximised wellbeing and reduced wellbeing inequity, what would it look like? Well, one of the first pieces of work we did at the centre was some public dialogues about what does wellbeing mean to you? And three areas came out of that. The first one was feeling safe. So feeling self safe financially, so understanding financial insecurity on what builds financial resilience feeling safe in terms of good physical and mental health, a primary driver of our individual well-being, about access to food and good food, about feeling safe in our jobs and employments, in housing, in access to natural environments and transport. The second element that came out was feeling loved, feeling respected and appreciated, feeling that we belong, having positive connections and also time alone having an appreciation of difference and a feeling that we're part of something bigger. The third one was about feeling fulfilled, that sense of achievement, of inspiration, of feeling valued, having fun and joy, learning opportunities, having control, agency and choice. So across all of our programmes that we've been hearing about today, I would love you to think about how in your own programmes you can build outcomes and understanding of feeling safe, feeling loved and feeling fulfilled. Wellbeing offers a, offers a really practical opportunity to inform public spending. 
um, it allows us to compare across interventions. And we see that life satisfaction measure in many frameworks, in the national outcomes framework, in the public health outcomes framework, and in the levelling up white paper as well. I know Claire didn't mention it, but the government has set well-being as an overarching goal of the levelling up white paper. Life satisfaction can be used as an outcome across a range of different spends. Um, in, our, in our recent review, we looked at what works to improve personal well-being and found things work across housing improvements and thermal efficiency, skills training, volunteering, physical activity, social prescribing, psychological interventions. Lots of different things work, which is why a wellbeing lens can help. So in terms of full five takeaways, our priorities, making wellbeing an outcome of your research, focusing on the outcomes that matter, feeling safe, loved and fulfilled, looking at communities and connections, Real, really keen to hear today the experiences of, of the ideas and um, shaping of children and people's programmes because 50% of our later adult wellbeing is determined by a life under 18. So building on the work of um, GM of Great Manchester, Greater Manchester, for example, looking at children's wellbeing is super important. Suicide prevention. I'm thinking particularly here of the groups that haven't had contact with health services or mental health diagnosis. It's absolutely no coincidence that those curves we see for antidepressant and suicide rates and life satisfaction are the mirror images. That purpose and meaning piece is really important. I hope we bring forward, pro bring forward programmes on workplace and, and workforce wellbeing because we know that again is a primary driver of wellbeing. And finally, because I'm an evidence centre, I want us to be great at evidence synthesis and getting that information out there so we can all share that. So I'm really grateful to be part of the conversations today and would urge you to, to support and join with the What Works Centres to share that knowledge. Thank you.